Hey, everyone. So um, for those of you that haven't met him, this is uh, Matt McEwen, who, who seems to be a resident of this room at the moment. Um, and, um, so what we're going to talk about today is kind of what, where, where we are with OpenStack Helm, where we've come from. Um, and I think sort of one of the, the best ways of, of talking about that is firstly starting with the, the mission of uh, OpenStack Helm which we set out about uh, 18 months ago to provide a collection of Helm charts that are simply, resilient, uh, simply resiliently and flexibly deploy discrete OpenStack and related services on Kubernetes. And we set out to do this essentially to try and solve, uh, at least within AT&T, and also generally the, the problem of OpenStack lifecycle management, um, where we felt that a lot of the tools that were existing uh, were very great at day, day one operations, but then when it came on to sort of operating these things further down the line, it became increasingly complex uh, to do so. And, you know, doing things like OpenStack upgrades for large organizations was a really, really scary thing to do. Uh, they involved an immense amount of time and planning, and it was very hard to do in a repeatable and declarative manner. And this was something that we we sort of quite quickly identified when it appeared on the market that Helm appeared to be quite a good solution to this. And it kind of led into our unofficial mission statement, which I'm really glad to see Airship adopting as well, um, in that we're looking to try and essentially be boring. I mean, at the end of the day, OpenStack operations is something that you definitely don't want to be exciting. Um, you want to have a cloud, it should be a stable cloud, one that you can manage, upgrade, and be usable without having to stay up all night and um, you know, deal with angry people on the phone. And so we kind of started about 2016 um, very much as a, as a proof of concept. Um, and we moved into OpenStack Infra in July 2017 as an unofficial project. And in October, uh, last year, we got official status, and at that point, uh, Matt uh, assumed the role of uh, PTL and really sort of guided that project out, out from the shadows and in, into the light. You know, in the sense of trying to take some of the initial stuff we had done, bring some sanity to our documentation, our gating, and um, another thing that happened, sort of alongside that, was the collection of projects that we, we had also developed uh, partly within, a, well, within AT&T and with, with support from people like SKT uh, collected into a form Airship, which, which obviously people that were at the last session should know quite a bit about. We've, we still haven't had our 1.0 release and we're looking to try and do that at some point uh, towards the end of this OpenStack development cycle. Um, and we've got, we've got a few things that we'll touch on today that I think we need to address before we do that in order to be able to provide and support within the community a, something that we, we're very confident that the sort of API won't change significantly and will allow us to deliver on that promise of you know, supportability and, and essentially boring operation where things just work. Um, we've had quite a lot of impact across different projects. Um, we originally started using uh, Cola containers for, for everything. Um, and as, as time went on, uh, started adopting uh, Loki, which was a, a new container project that formed that helped us produce some light, lightweight images with potentially slightly less opinionation to them than, uh, than came with Cola, which was uh, sort of one thing we really keen to see where we can have a bit more flexibility and a bit more lightweight around there. And so we, during the last cycle, adopted those as our default and are now really, really seeing some great success with them. Um, additionally, there's quite a few projects that have started using OpenStack Helm as, as well as ourselves. I mean, Airship uh, in particular uses uh, the Keystone and Barbican charts, I think as Mark and Matt touched on. They use the Helm toolkit that we developed, which is a series of uh, macro functions and helpers, essentially a library for Helm, um, uh, to help them with their chart deployment. 
and they also make use of some of our gates and checks in their Zool infrastructure. Um, the other uh, incubator project within the foundation, Starling X, is starting to uh, move towards using OpenStack Helm for its lifecycle management of OpenStack components. And it will also be using, I believe, Armada um, from Airship as well to help them in that journey. And then uh, Juniper and uh, the Tungsten Fabric community uh, are running a fork of our Nova and Neutron charts, and they're also making use of Helm Toolkit and the patterns that we laid out uh, for, for their deployment of their products on, on uh, Kubernetes. So the, the question was, is why does uh, Tungsten Fabric use forks and not the same charts? That's, that's a good question. Um, I think they feel that they're not yet at a stage where they want to upstream their work. They, they have some changes that they've made to Neutron that they're not yet comfortable with trying to merge upstream, although I've, I've reached out and encouraged them to do so. So I'm hoping that over the next couple of weeks, if not months, that that, that situation will be reduced because at the moment it is running alongside in parallel, whereas we merge things there, they're essentially taking air cherry picks of, of everything that we do and, and putting that into their own stuff, which is on one level great, but it would be nice to have a canonical source for, for all of that stuff. So over, over the last release, um, sort of because one, one thing I should sort of emphasize as well is that we're, we operate in a release independent um, category. So we don't actually tie ourselves to OpenStack releases. And when we, when we do eventually get to the stage of cutting our first release, we don't have any real intention of directly following OpenStack releases other than ideally defaulting to deploying the current OpenStack release. But because we have engineered our charts to support multiple versions of OpenStack, we, we don't feel that it's quite right us following that approach. Um, but o over, over the last cycle, we split uh, our charts into multiple repos. So we have our primary repo where we contain uh, Helm charts for uh, OpenStack uh, official services. Uh, we have a infra repository where we do all of our supporting services for OpenStack and logging and monitoring and alerting, which we view as a sort of critical part of a production-ready OpenStack deployment. Um, and we also contain most of our, our gating uh, infrastructure within there. And then an add-ons repository where we have some other things that we view as being quite important for any large enterprise or organization that's wanting to run OpenStack, things like charts for Artifactory and Jenkins that sort of tie neatly into the rest of uh, the, the ecosystem that we're building. Um, we also dramatically improved gating um, and actually provided some. Um, there's still a very long way to go, and that, that's something that I think we definitely need to do a huge amount of improvement on in the future, but we're now on every patch set into OpenStack Helm launch each of our charts, and then do a validation test in the form of launching a VM, SSHing into it, and attaching a Cinder volume. Um, and we moved from the defaulting to the Newton version of OpenStack to the Okata release. But our, our, I think our primary goal in the last release was um, concentrating on stability. Um, and if anyone was at the, the keynote uh, that AT&T did uh, the other day, you know, it's a demonstration of that because at least for some organizations, and I think some other tel telcos are doing the same, this is now moved out of the academic phase and is very much moving into production. Um, so it was very much about sort of in getting that resilience that we needed. And as part of that, providing LDAP integration across all relevant components so it could tie into an IT organization's infrastructure. When you say the change default for Okada, do you still support Newton or...? We do, we do still support Newton. Um, we, 
we need to actually decide at some point how long we are going to maintain that support for because there are things like the, the changes to cells V2 that weren't fully fleshed out in Newton that are in Ocata and onwards. So we're, we're, we're sort of at that point where we need to work out how much we want to maintain with our current charts compatibility um, across all OpenStack versions and how much we want to be able to take advantage by default of some of the new features that are available in newer releases of OpenStack. Which other version of OpenStack do you support? At the moment, uh, sorry, the question was is which version of OpenStack do we support? At the moment, we are gating um, for basic functionality on Newton, Okata, and Pike. Um, we have a patch set in place for Queens that just needs some polish. Um, and we also have contributors who are running master, um, but we don't yet have in place the sort of infrastructure to build images for that and test it. So we can go, in theory, we can go right to the current tip, but, but we need to improve that, that posture. And that's sort of, where, where we are in terms of OpenStack releases ties in quite nicely to some of the stuff we have been doing so far in the, in the current cycle, where we have added two more repositories. Uh, the images repository, where we are going to take the limited number of custom uh, Docker files that we have for OpenStack Helm, things like libvirt and MariahDB, um, and place them into a repository so that people can build them and we can start providing support for multiple distributions rather than just the Ubuntu distribution that we support at the moment. And then another repository for documentation um, for all, all of the projects as we start to spread across things. And on this, I'm really particularly excited because we have quite a large number of contributors in Asia and so hopefully we should be able to get quite good Korean documentation in place, which, which will be really, really nice to have as a project. The other thing that we've added is, um, and started to work on is uh, improving security, where we now support uh, TLS on all external facing traffic to and from the cluster. And in, in current development, um, sort of which is live at the moment, um, we're starting work on uh, support for multiple distributions uh, in the charts. Um, I think some, some members of the community, like uh, JP at the front here, is, is starting work on getting support for SUSE in place, and it would be great to see CentOS and other things coming as well. And hopefully the images repository and some, some more work that we're doing on the gating will help there. Um, we're also adding internal TLS, including certificate management via, via TILA, or the ability for operators to bring their own certificates for all internal things. So that's both going to be REST-based services and things like uh, MariahDB and RabbitMQ, and supporting uh, credential rotation, which is something that we anecdotally support at the moment for Keystone. Uh, there are some gray areas around uh, MariahDB and Rabbit. And again, this is something that we need to actually get gated and validated that we can, we can do. And then, as I sort of just mentioned, we're, we're starting work on an images repository, um, but we also need to start caching images, both in our gating environment and as well within the cluster to try and reduce the burden as um, things get distributed around, especially with large numbers of nodes. Is there La a oh, sorry. This? The the question was: Is Airship providing this sort of caching? Um, no, is the is the simple answer in the sense that we will develop a a chart for a local caching repository, which would be part of OpenStack Helm Infra, and then most likely Airship would leverage that chart as part of its deployment and use, use that component. I mean, um, in, in many ways, for, I, I think this is a gross over, oversimplification, um, but it, OpenStack Helm is a, is a project that provides batteries and projects like um, 
airship or a Starling X, you know, provide something that those batteries go inside. Um, is, the, is the easiest way to think of it. Um, and then the, the last sort of thing that I think we really need to work on because it's a very pressing pain point we have at the moment is improving our gating situation. Our gates at the moment on one level are quite effective because they provide pretty good validation that a service is functional but they also are greatly impeding the ability for developers to get their work merged and uh, the rate at which they're able to go because we, are, we need to do some work about optimizing what we're gating for, how fast those gates can run as a result, and also getting better feedback from those gates so that developers can see what changes they need to make in order to get their patches merged. And so I, I'm very... I'm very keen to see that, that improve. It kind of brings us on to sort of the future of where, where we're planning on going. Um, we, we're looking at and would like to get unit testing um, on a lot of our helper functions that we have in Helm Toolkit, and there's a, there's a unit testing framework for Helm that's emerging. Um, and we also need to have a look at a, Helm 3 as that starts to develop. It's under very, very slow development at the moment. Um, and it could have a few impacts for us. Um, in particular, it provides support for Lua scripting as well as uh, GoTPL templating. And I don't know if anyone on the team has really had time to look at that yet, but I think we need to evaluate What's that? what potential advantages we have, and if we want to start supporting Lua in our, in our charts as well moving forward. Um, and then there's obviously you know, a lot of hype around service meshes at the moment, and you know, we, I, we've done some sort of informal evaluations of sort of what, what they potentially would provide us, you know, and things of things like uh, API services where they potentially would be a good fit, and then you have agents that are running on the nodes. And here, a lot of the support that we kind of see for things like uh, Istio and um, Envoy and similar systems are probably not going to sort of help us much there in terms of providing secure communications when things are running in the host's networking namespace. So it, it's, it's emerging and something that we definitely need to keep on tracking, but I think at the, at the moment, the consensus seems to be that they're fairly immature for, for our sort of use case. And then when it comes on to both images and the charts themselves, it would be ideal to start publishing those from within OpenStack Infra and on a periodical basis so that we can take advantage of security patches and things when they come out. And then the other, the other sort of aspect of um, where, where we're looking is um, you know, things, things like operators and how, how those sort of potentially fit into the picture. I mean, they have really emerged um, over, over the last 18 months as potential ways of solving a lot of problems within Kubernetes. And you know, they, whereas, whereas sort of six, six months ago, they were still at that slightly academic phase there's now definite acceptance of them within the Kubernetes community and a huge shift towards looking, looking towards them. And they, they offer some really good advantages for things like uh, state management. However, there's still some concerns about sort of the ability for an operator to interact with many things, well, a human operator to interact with many things that a, an operator produces. So if, if you were going to look at things, then, then there can be some impact there. And so there's a potential for using them for managing OpenStack objects and bootstrapping services, but it's still very early. And is we're that, also... Uh, isn't that kind of more part of the whole Helm pillar part? Because also it just comes from like different areas of the Kubernetes ecosystem that the founders So the question was sort of how, how do operators relate to Tiller? I think they serve two separate use cases um, where operators are very good at sort of managing things that don't fit within traditional Kubernetes objects, whereas 
Helm is very good at templating and easing the management of Kubernetes native objects for applications that fit them well. So, so that's sort of where, where the difference in there lies. And then the other, the other thing that we're sort of trying to work on a lot uh, at the moment is trying to engage project teams more so that we can gain from their experience in particularly areas like Nova and Keystone so that we can improve the feedback loop, improve the quality of our deployments and, and hopefully gain more adoption from those communities as a, as a sort of preferential way of deploying and managing their services. Okay. And I suppose the la last thing is, is we have um, an OpenStack Helm channel on IRC and we hold uh, meetings uh, every week at 3 p.m. UTC and OpenStack meeting five. Uh, and the, you can also reach us via, via the OpenStack mailing list. We've also got a onboarding session at uh, 20 past three um, for uh, having, having a look at how you could start contributing to OpenStack Helm. And also in that session, it'd be great to get feedback on any, any people that have used OpenStack Helm at the moment, any pain points they've had or opportunity we have to improve things. Okay. And, uh, are there any questions or? Um, yeah. Uh, about the one dot o release, to what degree will that be synced with Airship's one dot o release, or is there plans to sort of align that? Or? So the the question was, with a one dot o release, is there any plans to synchronize that with Airship? They're also working towards the one point zero. Yeah, I there. There are no plans directly. I think, I think the way that sort of the everything will land is they will most likely happen around about similar times. But because they are, in essence, separate projects, there is no coupling between those two events, other than the fact that many of the people working on them have the same sort of imperative to try and get things stabilized around about the same sort of time. But but they are two separate activities from that perspective. Cool, so thanks everyone.